today I want to share uh, something. It's a love story. It's a love story from the Old Testament. And uh, just want to uh, figure out how, how, how the story comes about. I was thinking on, on this whole theme of love, this word of love, and um, the, the verse that came to my mind was this, God so loved the world. And beyond that, God is love. If God is love, Christ Jesus is love. Amen? So I wanted to, to trace back and to understand uh, the story of, of Christ Jesus and all, all that, that's happened. So um, uh, if I were to, to, uh, to, to look at, at this particular uh, message that, that we're going to listen to, I'm looking at the Old Testament and all of Old Testament that points to Christ Jesus who's going to come. We're going to focus on that. Um, and today the story is about uh, a love story. It's actually a love triangle. There is Jacob and there is Rachel and there is Leah. So we, we, we're going to look at their lives and we're going to see how, how things move on. Uh, the Bible talks about a couple. Uh, um, our text is from Genesis chapter 29. Uh, we're looking at verse 31 to 35 onwards. But before we go there, I just want to quickly run through a, a summary. Uh, the Bible talks about a couple. Um, and uh, the couple is Isaac and Rebecca. And Rebecca had um, uh, twins. And they were Jacob and Esau. And uh, Jacob, the, the second, the younger of the twin, um, stole his elder brother's birthright. And he, uh, so a murderous Esau was, was, was very upset. So to, just to escape his brother's anger, uh, his mother said, Jacob's mother said, go to my brother. His name is Laban. So Jacob is off to Laban. So Jacob is with this particular man called Laban. And uh, Jacob says, I'm here with you. I just, just don't want to simply um, um, be here and not do anything. I'll work. I'll work. So Laban said, yes, welcome. Laban has two daughters. Um, one is, the elder one is called Leah. And the younger one is called Rachel. Uh, now the Bible uh, describes them in a certain way. The Bible says that... Uh, Rachel was extremely beautiful. And Leah was, certain translations say weak of the eyes, or, 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 or basically if we were to dif dif differentiate the two, Rachel was beautiful. And just for the sake of this message, let's say Leah was ugly. Okay? So uh, not that I mean to, to, uh, to be rude to, to Leah, but... Just for now, let's differentiate the two, okay? If we have a beautiful Rachel and we have a ugly Leah, okay? And all along, there is this struggle that goes on. So we're going to look at their lives. So Jacob, he's working for, uh, for Laban and he sees beautiful Rachel and he falls in love with her. He wants to marry her. So he goes, as every Jewish young man should, goes to the girl's father and he says, I want to marry her. He said, sure, why not? So he said, fine, you work with me for seven years and then you can have Rachel as your reward. He works for seven years and on the day that he gets married and the next day morning he realizes it's not Rachel, it is Leah, the ugly of the two six sisters. So Jacob is upset. He goes to his father-in-law and says, what did you do? He said, I'm sorry, my culture... The younger cannot get married before the elder. So I had to do this. Talk about excuses. He uh, said, okay, fine. Why don't you work with me for another seven years and you'll get Rachel. Fine. He works for seven years and he marries Rachel. So now we're going to look. I've just zoomed in through a lot of years to come to this point. Okay, so we're looking at Genesis chapter 29. If you have your Bibles with you, please look with me. Chapter uh, 29 verse 31. The text goes like this. When the Lord saw that Leah, ugly Leah, 
was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So Leah conceived and bore a son. She called his name Reuben, for she said, The Lord has surely looked upon my affliction. Now therefore my husband will love me. Verse 33, Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. Verse 34, she conceived again and she bore a son. Now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons and now she calls this third son Levi. Verse 35, and she conceived again and she bore a son and now I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah and then she stopped bearing children. We're going to chapter 30. Verse 1. It goes like this. Now Rachel, when she saw, now Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister. She said to Jacob, Give me children, or else I'll die. Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel, and he said, Am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? So she said, here is my maid, Bilha, go to her and she will bear a child on my knees that I also may have children by her. Then she gave him Bilha, her maid, as wife and Jacob went into her and Bilha conceived and bore Jacob a son. Um, before we get into the message, let's just take a little time to look up to the Lord. Father, we thank you for this evening, Lord. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. Father, we thank you that your plans are perfect, your ways are perfect, and you are a perfect God. Father, as we spend some time to, to uh, meditate and ponder on these, this text that we read, I pray that you would open our hearts to receive your word, that, that this word will fall on good ground, it will bear good fruit, and that your name alone be glorified today tomorrow and for all the days to come. We love you, Lord. We give this time into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I have read this text multiple times all along since I've been a child. And there were a couple of objections that came to me. And uh, one of the objections which, not just in this text, but multiple texts around the Old Testament, uh, one of the objections was this, does the Bible support polygamy? Uh, how come uh, men have multiple wives? Uh, how come uh, it's, it's not, uh, uh, does the Bible support polygamy? And the, there's a one simple answer, and that's no. The Bible does not support polygamy. So then what about these people? And what about them having multiple wives? Uh, the Bible is an account of people who were in old and who were there in, in, in those times. It's an honest account of their lives. Everything that they did is not always perfect. The Bible gives accounts of men who were adulterous. Does it mean adultery is allowed? The Bible gives account of uh, men uh, who were murderous, who murdered people. Does it mean murder is allowed? It does not mean. So, in short, we can be very clear from this text. The first objection, the Bible does not support polygamy. The Bible, uh, if we were to look back, when God created Adam, God created Eve. One for one. God created a male and a female. God's plan has always been clear and perfect. Sarah had, uh, Abraham had Sarai, Sarai or Sarah. Isaac had Rebecca. So uh, all these men who were having more than one wives, they were going beyond God's will. This is the first objection that would come to anyone who's, who's, who's looking at these words. The second objection is a little more difficult to handle. The second objection goes like this. Is God biased? Is God biased? The text says, God, uh, Rachel was beautiful and Leah was ugly. 
is God biased in, 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 in having this? Uh, this is a little more difficult to address. But, but as I spent time thinking on this, I realized uh, it says Rachel is beautiful. Beauty. What exactly is beauty? Uh, beauty changes all the time. Beauty is man's way of looking at, at, at what is beauty. Uh, I spent some time to, to understand, uh, to have a look at, at this, this thought of beauty. Here is a, a, a just a snapshot of world's, these are Miss Universe contestants who have been winners all the way from 1969 till 2018. And uh, it's, it's not clear, but I had to bring it all in one slide. Uh, I was wondering on, 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 on this, uh, this presentation. Uh, these are Miss U Universe who are Miss Universe for a year, 12 months. Are they not beautiful in the 13th month? What happens in the 13th month? Are they not beautiful or there is somebody else who is more beautiful than them? Man's idea of beauty is ever changing. The way man looks at beauty is not the way God looks at beauty. God looks at way beyond. And we all understand the physical beauty is changing. We are young today. We will not be young one day. So, so that argument being, uh, being addressed, how about uh, the, the, there is an aspect of beauty that comes with wealth. Someone who has more money is considered to be more more beautiful or in some way better privileged than us. What about someone who's more skillful? Uh, we have got musicians who come up and play. Their level of beauty in terms of music knowledge and playing music or someone who can sing very well. They are higher placed because God has given them more talent. God is, uh, God is not biased. It's our way of looking at it. So uh, God is not biased in, in, in any way. Having addressed that, uh, who would you rather be? Would you be Rachel or would you be Leah? Would you be beautiful Rachel or what, would you be Leah? Uh, if I were to ask each and every one this question on a, on a group basis, most likely your preference would be that I would rather be beautiful Rachel. Is there anyone who would say that I would be, I would want to be Leah? N nobody. <laughs> okay, so, so let's assume, let's assume fairly that, that we would, if given a choice, we would rather be beautiful Rachel. All right? So, uh, can we blame Jacob for being biased towards beautiful Rachel? Definitely not, because he is also a, a human being like us. So, why this difference? I want to bring out two, uh, two uh, key things as we look at this text. And that is, what's, what's in it for in this love story? The text that we read, both Leah and Rachel are using God. They are using God's name for whatever they want. Uh, verse 31 says, when God, when the Lord saw Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So, Ra so Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, for, he, for she said, The Lord has surely looked on my affliction, now therefore my husband will love me. The Lord has looked on my affliction. She is using the Lord's name, therefore my husband will love me. What's her focus? She wants her husband's love. She has a second child. It's very easy to get lost in the, uh, uh, in, in the reading of the text, but there's a lot more happening. There is a lot, lot more happening in this scenario. She gives, gets a second child, and she says that the 
Because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. Uh, God is drawing Rachel, God is drawing Leah by giving her what she wants. On the other hand, God is drawing Rachel by not giving her what she wants. This is what we want to look at, that how God is drawing these two ladies, these two, two uh, individuals to himself. Um, quickly, if we run through the, the, uh, the chronology, the, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, the lineage of, of this family, we have Isaac and Rebecca. They have two sons. We're looking at Jacob, the younger son. And Jacob is married to Leah and Rachel. And besides that, he has two more um, um, maids or uh, 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 servants of, of these two ladies. Leah, she gives birth to a total of six boys and one girl. So she has given birth to seven children. Uh, besides that, uh, Rachel has two sons. The two... Uh, uh, May, uh, uh, servants, they have got two more. So in all, Jacob is the father of 12 boys and there is one daughter as well. And this is how, I just tried, tried, tried to show you the order in which the, the, the children came. So Leah had four children, Reuben, Simeon, Levi and Judah. And then after that, Bilhah, who was um, Rachel's maid, through Bilhah, Jacob had two boys and when that happened, Leah said, Jacob, you go to my uh, 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 lady and through Zilpha, he had two more. And then Rachel had the last two set of children. Uh, let's look at uh, Leah. When she had the first child, she said, surely my husband will love me now. Can you feel her pain? Can you feel the struggle that she is going through in her life? Now, let's re re rewind back a little. Uh, not a little, quite a bit, actually. Uh, imagine a beautiful sister and a not-so-beautiful sister. All their life, the struggle. If someone were to re re refer to Laban's family, uh, it would be referred to as Rachel's family more than Leah because Leah nobody cares for. But a, a, a beautiful person, there is, there, is a, there is a name attached to that. There, there is a respect, there is an honor. So Leah is all along struggling for her place. Leah is all along struggling to have a name for herself. And finally, when she, um, uh, when she got married, she has a child. But then she re she's got married. But the husband is more interested in Rachel than in her. So now that she's had a child, she is assuming that now that I have a, ch a child, Jacob is going to love me now. So when she has the first child, she says, now my husband will love me. Sadly, that's not the case. She goes to have a second child. She says, the Lord has heard that I am unloved. And then she has a third child, Levi. My husband will come attached to me now because I have borne him three boys. And then she has the fourth child. And she names this child Judah. And she says, this time I will praise the Lord. This is a big change. What changed? The previous three responses were all about Jacob. My husband should love me. My husband should come back to me. But when the fourth child was born, something changed. What changed? Please hold that thought. We're going to come back here. What changed? Let's look at Rachel. Beautiful Rachel always gets everything what she wants. Perhaps she learned to use her beauty to win people's heart, maybe she's waiting at a water queue and then she's a beautiful girl and she crosses through all through the line and she gets the earlier preference. For whatever reason, she had always had things going her way. If 
she started having babies right away, she would have assumed, of course, I'm beautiful. I'm supposed to get everything. But God made her wait. God made her wait. So while having children made Leah think of God, not having children was God's way to make her come back to him. Now, God made Rachel wait because that was absolutely necessary for Rachel's soul. That for Rachel, getting back her husband and holding on to this husband was the most important thing in her life. Uh, she's willing to do whatever it takes to win her husband. One day, she goes to uh, Jacob and she says, Give me children or else I'll die. She's willing to emotionally blackmail and manipulate her husband. She's willing to do whatever it takes to, to, have, the, to, to have her way. If that doesn't work, she comes out with this idea of surrogate motherhood. She says, here's my maid. You take her and give me children so I can also be called blessed. That is what she was looking for. If, you're, if you have your Bibles with you, would you turn to Genesis chapter 30? I'm looking at verse 14. Genesis chapter 30, verse 14. Now, we're looking at Reuben. Reuben is Rachel's eldest son. Okay? And one day he comes home and, and he's got something in his hand. So let's read, read the text. Now, Reuben went in the days of the wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field. He brought them to his mother, Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, Please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, This is Leah, complaining to Rachel, Is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrake as well? And Rachel said, Therefore, Okay. Rachel says, you can have Jacob for the night in exchange for the mandrakes. So when Jacob came out of, the, out of the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come to me for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. Clearly, Rachel is trying many things. Emotional black, blackmail, she's trying mandrakes. Now, I don't know the, the, the medicinal function of mandrakes right now, but mandrakes during those days were called fertility plants. So Rachel was willing to go for medicines, fertility plants, emotional blackmail, even her maid, to have her way. Imagine Jacob. Poor Jacob. He has Laban as a, ruth, a ruthless and a shrewd boss. He's a slave master. He's making Jacob work. And besides that, he has to contend with an ongoing baby-making race. All along, Leah, Rachel, the maids, babies, babies, and he's just, just in this situation where he's surrounded by four ladies. When he's coming in, four of them are waiting for him. One day it so happens, he's coming from field, one of them is not even willing to wait at the door. She comes running to him and says, I have bought you with my son's mandrakes. Poor Jacob, what he's going through. For Rachel, God is, has not been the first resort. It seems God has been the last resort. For the same, Genesis chapter 30, verse 22. It reads like this. Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her, and opened her womb. 
If you read Genesis chapter 30 or even before, there is not a single mention of Rachel praying. There is not a single mention of Rachel going to God for anything. She's willing to, because she's beautiful, she's had everything that she wants, she thinks everything is her right. But God is making her wait. She is not seeing that yet. She is willing to blackmail Jacob. She is willing to have, go to medicines. She is willing to, go to, to use her maids. But she is not willing to go to God. But verse 22 says, God remembered Rachel and God listened to her. And when she cried out to God, God listened to her. And then Rachel bore a son and his name was Joseph. What a struggle. What a family. Surely this is not the example of the family that you want to em emulate or we want to emulate. But it's worth studying that God is blessing one wife because he wants to draw her to himself and one, he's withholding certain things till she comes to him. Verse 22 says, God heard her, pr her prayer, her cry, and opened her womb. Whose side are you on? Indulge, let's uh, indulge, the, uh, let's have a sarcastic look at this situation. Uh, whose side are you on? Who do you want to be with? Do you want to be with Jacob? Poor man, how much he had to suffer. He, he left his father's house in the desert, working for more than 14 years, trying to win a, a, a wife for himself. Uh, do you pity him? Do you, do you, are you on his side? I'm not. What about Rachel? What a burden to be beautiful. What a burden to, to be the center of attention over everything. You walk on the street you are folk, everyone is looking at you. you. You do something, there is immediately a news out in the market. What a burden to be beautiful. Do you empathize with Rachel? Do you sympathize with her? Are you on Rachel's side? I am not. What about Leah? Ugly Leah. So ugly, that her father had to cheat Jacob into marrying her. Maybe because he believed that nobody is going to marry this daughter. And he found a good opportunity. So ugly that the father didn't even consider her. So ugly, so lonely, so unwanted, so despised. I think Leah is the saddest of the three. And God is closest to those who are saddest. That's the second thing which, which I want to draw out of this, this passage. Christ Jesus is closest to those who are saddest. He's most intimate with those who are most unfortunate. The most op oppressed of the three, Jesus was closest to Leah. Put in an, another way, in this season of her life, Leah experienced Jesus more intimately than the other two. So now your question would be, uh, hello, Jesus, this is Old Testament. Where does Jesus come, come in this picture? Jesus, Jesus was, wasn't even born. Now, uh, if you remember, I left one question unanswered. What changed when, when Leah gave birth to the fourth son? What changed? Everything changed. When Judah was born, because Christ Jesus was to descend from the line of Judah. You see, Abraham, one day God called him and said, you have this son, your only son, uh, 
not your, you, you have offered, give your son to me as a sacrifice. So Abraham took Isaac to the mount to sacrifice him. There, an angel appeared. After all of that, I'm, I'm, I'm ru running through, through the story, an angel appeared. And uh, the angel of, of the Lord called out to Abraham. And it said in Genesis chapter 22, it goes, the story is in verse 16 to 18. It, it goes like this. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. The angel of the Lord says to Abraham, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Abraham's seed is, has come all the way to Jacob, has come to, to Leah. The next slide is basically a lineage of Jesus according to the book of Luke. And this is the entire family tree. Not the tree actually, but I'm just drawing a straight line. All the way from God to Abraham to Jesus. The number 77 that you see is Jesus. And there's Jacob and Judah on 24 and 25. We are looking at 52 generations later comes Jesus. Leah at this point had no idea. Leah knew nothing about it. She knew the promise to Abraham that through his seed, all the nations of the world will be blessed, but she had no idea that through the seed that is Jesus, today the entire earth is blessed. you believe that? Leah had no idea. If you remember the three statements that she made when the three boys were born, the, the three statement goes like this. Now my husband will love me. The Lord has heard I am unloved. My husband finally will come attached to me. The three statements for the three boys. But listen to what she says when Judah was born. She says, this time I will praise the Lord. This time I will praise the Lord. God was waiting. God was waiting to draw her to himself. And when she understood that, that and she names him Judah. God was waiting to draw her. And when she, Leah realized that, the verse immediately says she stopped having children. The fourth child and she stopped having children. Later on, she goes on um, to have three more. But then at that point, she stops having children. What changed? Her perspective changed. Her mind changed. She was drawn closer to God at this point in her life. Leah was just as ugly before she got married as she was when the fourth child was born. She didn't become beautiful overnight. She was just as ugly, just as unloved, just as lonely. But what changed? She realized that I need something beyond all this. I need God. And that's what changed for Leah. And one, when that happened, you can see history changed. Everything changed after that. In Galatians chapter 3, it says, When God called Abraham, Jacob's grandfather, God promised Abraham through the seed that through your seed I will bless the nations. Abraham had two sons. Jesus had to descend from one of these two. He descended from Isaac and not Ishmael. Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. Jacob and Jesus de descended through Jacob and not Esau. Jacob had 12 sons. Six from Leah, two each from Rachel and the other two servants. Christ Jesus descended through the fourth son of Leah, Judah. In this season, Jesus was most closest to Leah because she was hurting the most. She was lonely. She was struggling the most. Christ Jesus was closest to her. The ugliest of the two wives. The saddest of the two wives. 
the loneliest of the two wives, carried the seed of Jesus in her womb. The ugliness of Leah points to the ugliness of Jesus. And now why am I calling Jesus ugly? He's infinitely beautiful. But on the cross, when Jesus hung, he did not hang for his own sins, but for your sins and mine. God rejected Jesus on the cross. God punished Jesus. It was the anger of God, and it was not the Roman soldiers. It was not the Pharisees who wanted Jesus crucified. God gave up his son. On Mount Moriah, one son was offered as sacrifice. When Abraham lifted his hand to strike that son, God stopped his hand. On another mountain called Calvary, another son was there. But this time God's hand didn't stop. This time, even when this son, his only begotten son said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God was silent. Jesus was silent after that. The angels were silent after that. God's hand didn't stop on that mountain. Jesus was loneliest on that cross. His disciples deserted him. His friends deserted him. Nothing. All the various people that he healed in all those three and a half years, everyone deserted him. He was the loneliest on the cross. He understands your loneliness. If you are the person who feels like Leah, lonely, deserted, let down, let alone, Take heart, Jesus is closest to you right now in this very season of your life. The loneliness of Leah points to the loneliness of Christ. What about us? Haven't we been selfish like Rachel? Only looking at our own benefits, only looking at our own agendas and schemes? We too have been like Rachel. We too have let Jesus down. If you truly des desire to draw close to Jesus, you have to understand his heart. You have to understand that he is more interested in your soul than your welfare and well-being and all the goodies that come around with that. He wants you forever with him in heaven. Not a temporary time of fun and a temporary time of, of all the pleasures of life. He wants you forever with him in heaven. And for you to reach heaven, he's preparing you here. He's letting you know that he's closest to you in your sufferings. He's closest to you in your weakest moments, in your strongest trials. He's closest to you. I just want to end with a closing thought. I want to end this competition between the two sisters. This rivalry, I want to bring it to an end. Can you go back to the previous slide? I'm, I'm comparing Rachel and Leah. Uh, Rachel died giving birth to her second son, that was Benjamin. And uh, G, uh, she died on the way as they were traveling. And uh, if you were here last week or, or if, you were, if you were in any of our services, uh, there, there was a guest preacher and, and he spoke about uh, Mary, uh, traveling when she was nearly eight months pregnant. And uh, a lot of, lot of things were, were spoken around that, if you remember. I happen to remember a little more because I listened to the same message twice. Uh, Pastor Gerald will remember even more because he, he, would, he would have had multiple doses of it. But uh, if, if you would recollect, what, what, uh, what was shared and what we learned last week was this. Pregnant women, when they are traveling in that season, it's natural for, for the baby to not survive or the mother to not survive. So when the text says that the baby was wrapped in swaddling clothes, 
those swaddling clothes were actually burial clothes. Rachel is traveling here. She has a very hard labor with Benjamin and she dies. Jacob is heartbroken. He, and during those days, there was no embalming process. So when a person dies, there's no way you can preserve the body. So he took her body and dug a grave and put her in the ground. No name, no fame, just a, a, a grave. Let's look at Leah. There's no mention of her death, uh, but listen to what's Jacob's last wish. This is in Genesis chapter 29, and, uh, and just, I'll just read the uh, Jap Genesis chapter 49. Verse 29 goes like this. This is Jacob telling his sons, I am to be gathered to my people, bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron and Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which Abraham bought. There, in this cave, they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There, they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. There, I will be buried with Leah. Jacob wants to be buried with ugly Leah. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the redemption that came to a life full of shame? When Jacob says, I want to be buried with my wife Leah, right next to her grave. So I go back to this question. Remember I asked, who would you rather be? Would you rather be Rachel or would you rather be Leah? Christ Jesus is closest to those who go through a hard time. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we spend this season, as we look at this word love, you are the God of love. You are the God who promised love. Father, you, Jesus, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity in heaven, you understand love better than anybody else. But yet you were willing to be separated from your son when he came to the earth. You were willing to be separated from your son for him to die on the cross so that we can have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe on him, whosoever would believe on him, whosoever would believe on him would not perish, but have eternal life. Father, as we look upon Rachel and Leah, allow us to understand that you are drawing us closer to you. Even in this Christmas season, not lost in the gifts and the fancies and the lights, but to understand that, Lord, you are drawing us to yourself, that you care for us more than anything else. Speak to us this season and for all the days to come. And Father, at this time, if anyone amongst us who is struggling to have children, I bring them to your presence this afternoon, Lord. Christ Jesus is closest to those who are struggling. Christ Jesus to those, closest to those who are having a hard time. Would you answer their prayers? Those who are looking for jobs or a breakthrough, those who are looking for health reasons, Lord, answer their prayers. Touch them in a special way. May this Christmas season and all the days to come be blessed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.